on we go. It's time to reread Night Shift. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Dave Musson at Dave Musson on Instagram, and this is the place where I talk to you about all things Stephen King. And as you know already by now, we are back on the chronological reread trail. And in this video, I'm going to take you through my reread of Night Shift the 1978 collection of short stories by Stephen King. Now, before we get onto that, do check out the links in the description to find my range of Stephen King themed band shirts, my own collection of short stories, Once More Around the Sun. If you like Night Shift, there's a chance you'll like this one too. It's won some awards as well. I've got a newsletter you can sign up to and loads of other stuff as well. But most of all, thank you for checking out this video. If you want to subscribe, that would be awesome too. So as I mentioned, this is part of my chronological reread series. So. If you haven't seen any of these other ones yet, you can check out the full playlist, but we're up to episode five by now because it's book five of King's career. So what I'll do is I'll give you a bit of a vlog of me rereading the book, offering some thoughts right there and then as I'm reading the stuff off the page. And then once I've done reading, I'll take you through some overall final thoughts of the book. For this one, because it's short stories, I will go through my ranking of the stories from least favourite to most favourite. And then we'll go through a few things. So we'll see how Night Shift scores on my Stephen King bingo card that I made. Looking out for 19 things that appear in lots of Stephen King books. I'll offer three pros and three cons of Night Shift. So three things I really liked, three things I didn't. I'll talk through a few things that I noticed for the first time on this reread. So... That's a lot of connections to other King works, nine teams, names that might come up again, all of those kind of things. And then I will give it a score out of five. Now what we're going to score out of five for this time, I think given the iconic cover art from the 70s of Night Shift, all the eyeballs on the hand, I think it's going to have to be five eyes on a bandaged hand. So we'll score it out of that. But before we get to any of that, a little bit of background about my shift and then I'll show you my additions as well. So some fun facts about Night Shift. It was first released on the 17th of February 1978 and it was Stephen King's first collection of short stories. There are 20 stories gathered in this collection and 16 of them had already been published in a variety of men's magazines throughout the 70s. The new ones for this publication were Jerusalem's Lot, Quitters Inc, The Last Rung on the Ladder, and The Woman in the Room. So some other trivia about Night Shift. This was the first book for which Stephen King wrote a foreword, and I will cover that in my vlog. And it also was the first book of Stephen King's that had an introduction. This had a guest introduction by John D. McDonald. And if memory serves me correctly, that intro was pretty fun as well. So I'll probably cover that as well. One other little tidbit for you. The story Grey Matter, which is in Night Shift. King didn't want to include that in Night Shift. He wanted to include a story called Suffer the Little Children. But his editor convinced him otherwise and Grey Matter made the cut. However, you might know the name Suffer the Little Children because it didn't stay hidden forever. It finally made it out into the world in Nightmares and Dreamscapes, which we will get to on the chronological reread in quite a long time. Some other little bits for you. So Night Shift was one that spawned a lot of movie adaptations that has since spawned a lot of Dollar Baby things as well. So obviously Children of the Corn, we've got Quitters Inc. and The Ledge, which appeared in Cat's Eye. Jerusalem's Lot eventually became Chapel Weight. Trucks became Maximum Overdrive and Trucks. And probably some other ones that I'm just forgetting off the top of my head. Strawberry Spring became a true crime podcast. It's spawned a lot of things that you've probably seen. And interestingly with Night Shift, there's not a full audiobook for it. There is a version of Night Shift that has 16 stories that was released as an audiobook in the year 2000. Okay, I think that's enough trivia about Night Shift. I'm excited to go back and reread Night Shift because this is a book... I always recommend to people. It's what I always recommend to people as a good starting point for King. And it's one that I think objectively is probably seen as his best collection of short stories. Now, what my plan is with this vlog is to go through and give each story a score out of five right there when I finish it. 
and maybe use those scores, average them out to help with my overall ranking out of five. We'll have to see how that goes. But it might be interesting to see over the course of doing these rereads, perhaps comparing the short story collections, and maybe we could go hyper analytical and work out what percentage of the stories did I give a score of four or more out of five for, and therefore which of these collections is the biggest hitter or the most consistent. I don't know, maybe I'll do that. But I'm really looking forward to going back to these stories. Some of them I have reread here and there in preparation for watching the movies that I've been covering on this channel. Others I haven't read for a long time. So yeah, very excited to go back. And I'm about to do that. But not before I show you my editions and pick which one I'm going to read for this reread. So somewhat ridiculously, I have four editions and my shift. And I'm going to enjoy showing them to you right now. So we have this one, which I really like little interactive version so you can see it's just blue with some eyes picking out and then boop, when you hold it open you get the font image so that one's fun but he's a little fragile and the text is really small so i'm not going to read that one i also as you've probably seen on my bookshelves have this one not an original one because it says author of it which was obviously from 1986 but a version of the original artwork. Again, this is old and the lettering is very small. So I'm not going to read this one. Nice advert for the first version of the Dark Tower in the back there. Um, so yeah, not going to do that one. This one is probably my favourite one. A UK paperback first edition that I managed to snag from my friends at Off World Books. You should check out on Etsy. Just love the typeface on it. Again, well, not as bad. They're actually, yeah, pretty small. Yeah, actually, ridiculously small. Maybe reading that, I just like it to look at. But the one I'm going to read is my sturdy rainbow edition. Turquoise sword. Spine, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, yeah, I like the rainbow editions. They're easy to read. Nice font size. Just just a pleasant reading experience and they're my favorite editions so that's what i'm gonna do so those are my editions we've talked a bit about night shift let's get into it shall we here's my vlog rereading stephen king's i chew so the reread of night shift is on and what i'm gonna do for the vlog is give some immediate thoughts after finishing each story but i wanted to start by talking about the introduction and the foreword so Night Shift was the first of King's books to feature both an introduction and a foreword in the first edition. Um, and they're both really worth reading. So the introduction from John D. MacDonald is just great. There's so much love for the craft of writing there, but also it's fascinating seeing him at that point already recognizing that Stephen King was way more than just horror. He references the woman in the room, was it the woman in the room or maybe the last rung on the ladder? Uh, I can't remember now. He references one of them and sort of uses that to say, look, this guy isn't just going to write horror. He's clearly going to write other stuff. I thought that was that was really telling. And also liked the last line of his introduction. It was great. It was like something like, um, I hope you've got plenty of time because you spent all this time reading this introduction when you could have been reading the stories. Genuinely, it made me laugh. And then King's Forward, which is quite long, but it's a really fascinating essay on fear and what makes fear that I just really enjoyed. Um, I particularly liked him talking about himself and he talks about, you know, how having this brain for stories and stuff might be considered a madness, but actually he calls it, he says, I have a marketable obsession which I think is a really good way of, of putting it. And he talks about how he dedicates Night Shift to his mother, who had died a few years earlier, just after seeing him get his deal for Carrie. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that as a as an opening to the book. Like I say, the first time King wrote a foreword of the first of his books to have an introduction. And, yeah, they're usually things that people might skip over, but if you're about to go in and give Night Shift a go, start with them because they're both genuinely excellent okay then first story down jerusalem's lot i will say that this feels like an odd choice to open the collection with like i'm somebody who believes in structuring these collections 
No. My son's just arrived. I will continue this update in a moment. Can I do it after that? Do I do it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You'll be pleased to know my son has done a poo and I need to change his nappy. But he's letting me do this little update for you before, aren't you? You want me to do the video first? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So as I was saying, I think it's an odd choice to open the collection because it's so wildly different to anything King has done in his career. It's this epistolary story set in the 1800s. Great sense of dread and some of the reveals are excellent. It all goes a bit Lovecrafty at points. Like the worm is really disturbing, the zombified people, but like it doesn't feel like a Stephen King short story. And I think I've just forgotten that it opened Night Shift, to be honest. It's not one that sticks in my memory much. Um, and I think there's a lot to like about it, but I struggle with stories that are set in the 1800, weirdly. So it's one that, I don't know. I'm generally underwhelmed by it. I can, I can objectively see that it's a very good story. I would probably give it two out of five for the story. And I'm conscious that's being a harsh marker. But a couple of good moments. I mean, the image of the lamb having just been squeezed to death. That's pretty damn haunting. Um, and obviously there's sort of the noises in the walls and stuff. Just all kinds of freaky. But yeah, we're up and running. Jerusalem's lot. I don't like it as much as it probably deserves to be liked, but that's on me. Two out of five. On with the next one. So Graveyard Shift done. Oh, I'd forgotten how good that one was. Some lines I wrote down here. Obviously lots of rats in Graveyard Shift. And there's a bit where a rat bites one of the workers. It just describes it as grabbed onto his hand and started chewing. Oof. Um, the rats are closed in around them, silent as death. Yeah, creepy. But the bit where Hall hears a sudden wet ripping noise. God, that took me over the edge. And then there's like two paragraphs at the end where describing Hall trying to get out that ends with him that ends with him in this high screaming sound. Yeah, yeah, just so good. And the ending itself was spectacular. Like it almost feels cliched reading it now, but this was King inventing this stuff. Um yeah, so good, so scary. 3.75 out of 5 for me. My little help has arrived again. Hello. Oh, a cuddle. I got a cuddle from my boy. Hello. Um, that's Graveyard Shift done. On to the next this one. This is my ball. It is your ball. So I'm done with Night Surf, which obviously features a flu-like virus called A6 or Captain Trips, which would go on to feature in the stand. This, this is potentially either a different level of the tower, though, because the characters talk about A6 coming out of Southeast Asia, which we know doesn't happen in the stand, or it's simply that these characters are believing the government propaganda. Who knows, to be absolutely certain. Um, the story was fine, very short, um, but despite it only being like 10 pages, Seemed to pack in a load of fat phobia pretty much every other page, which was a bit off-putting, to be honest. Um, I can see how King was trying to be literary with it and trying to just sort of give us this vignette. It didn't really work for me. Um, so I'm probably landing at somewhere between 1.5 and 1.75 out of 5 for this one. Like, perfectly fine. A couple of nice bits but yeah too much that put me off and I'm not into the stand that much anyway um, and it all just seemed it just seemed a bit unfinished actually and that's the main problem with it so there we go there's Night Surf. So I Am The Doorway ticked off definitely my favourite of Night Shift so far probably a 4.5 out of 5 for me I'd just forgotten quite how terrifying this story is and it's full of great lines like I won't be surprised at all if when we get to the favourite lines section at the end of this vlog that at least one from Eye on the Door would be here. Like a couple to read out for you. Beneath the bandages, my new eyes stared blindly into the darkness the bandages forced on them. They itched. Even that's interesting. He's using bandages twice in the same sentence. Probably wouldn't do that now. Um, and there you go. You can see his development as a writer. 
um, love the image of the guy talking about orbiting Venus and it being like circling a haunted house in the middle of space. I thought that was very cool. Um, the ending of the story is so good. Um, and something else I was going to read out. Um, I had looked into my own face and had seen a monster. Yeah, pretty good. Um, if you're not from, if you don't remember, this is the story with the eyes on the hands. Um, the one that, where is it? I see it up there. It's up there somewhere, isn't it? Yeah. The classic front cover for Night Shift is this story. And the doorway. Very, 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 very good. What have I got next? The Mangler. I, just, I mean, this book, it's, it's greatest hits, isn't it? When it comes to short stories, um, I'm having a lovely time. See you at the next one. So The Mangler, done that. Another enjoyable one. Although it does feel a little bit piecemeal, a bit, a bit bitty. Um, particularly compared to like Graveyard Shift, which is a quite similar story in terms of, you know, they feel like, not quite twinners, but they certainly feel like, like close cousins. Whereas, you know, Graveyard Shift seems to have quite good momentum all the way through. The Mangler is like lots of small scenes sort of smooshed together. I still like it. I still think it's a great story and it's got some, some brilliant moments. Um, I mean, the line where they just talk about how the woman who gets ate, eaten by the mangler, how they took her out in a basket. That is just like, huh. And the little story we get about the refrigerator, that obviously made me think a bit about what happens with Patrick Hochstetter in It. Um, and one thing I did notice, um, possibly the first time in King's bibliography, was the mention of a character's Adam's apple bobbing up and down like a monkey on a stick, which does seem to be a, um, a popular King phrase. But yeah, I think... 3.75 out of 5 for me, uh, which is the same as Graveyard Shift. So hmm, maybe I should knock that down to 3.5 out of 5. Yeah, I think I'll do that because Graveyard Shift is probably better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that right now on my notes. Um, Graveyard Shift is probably that little bit better as an entire story. Um, I mean, I mean, they're both fun though, right? Um, so what we've got next, The Boogeyman. Yeah, that should be good. Again, I'm I'm just having a great time with this. Like, you should read Night Shift too. You'll enjoy it. And if you've already read it, read it again, because it's even better going back to it. So done with the Boogeyman, uh, another terrific story. And I love how even just over the course of 15 or so pages, King is able to make you absolutely hate Lester Billings. Like the way he throws away lines like referring to children and saying like, the younger they are, the less you get attached to them. So basically it doesn't matter if they die. And he's racist, he's sexist, he's horrible. But also you kind of feel sympathy for him as well. There's this line where he describes his hands as being the hands that had thrown dirt onto three coffins, which really got under my skin. Um, but just a great, great story. So scary, wonderful ending. And some kind of precursors to Pennywise I found as well. There's a bit where Lester is talking about how kids in particular can be scared enough about monsters so much that you almost will them into existence which is kind of like Pennywise playing, playing on your fears and in the same line he talks about you know maybe those kids that have gone missing didn't drown in a lake or get lost in the woods or whatever they were actually taken by Frankenstein or a werewolf or a mummy and again kind of made me think of the forms that Pennywise takes so um yeah just a just such a good story and the, the ending with the the boogeyman in the cupboard with a voice coming like it's coming from a mouth full of seaweed saying so nice so nice absolutely chilling um so yeah i give that one 4.5 out of 5 it's um joint top for me and the only downside is with the story being so good that it makes me hate the movie from last year even more because they really they really messed up that one um, but anyway, we're talking about the book. So what have we got next? Grey Matter next. Oh, this is a good run, isn't it? Just, I am the doorway, the mangler, the boogeyman, Grey Matter. Bang, 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 bang. Let's see how we get on. So I am away for work, which means I had a bit of a train journey today. 
So I indulged myself and did not just one story from Night Shift like I've been doing so far this month, but two stories. So I've done Grey Matter and Battleground. So Grey Matter, I gave three and a half out of five for some really good stuff in there. I'd forgotten that it was a banger story. Um, and there's a, there's some, a description, let me find it, where a guy called George Kelso, who works in the Derry Sewers, describes him. Well, see if this sounds familiar. So I once knew a fellow named George Kelso who worked for the Bangor Public Works Department. He spent 15 years fixing water mains and mending electricity cables and all that. And then one day he just up and quit, not two years before his retirement. Frankie Haldeman, who knew him, said George went down into a sewer pipe on Essex, laughing and joking just like always, and came up 15 minutes later with his hair just as white as snow and his eyes staring like he'd just looked through a window into hell. He walked straight down to the BPW garage, punched his, punched his clock and went down to Wally's Spa and started drinking. It killed him two, day, two years later. Frankie said he tried to talk to him about it and George said something one time and that was when he was pretty well blotto. Turned around on his stool, George did, and asked Frankie Haldeman if he'd ever seen a spider as big as a good-sized dog sitting in a web full of kitties and such all wrapped in silk thread. I mean, that guy saw Pennywise right clearly. Um, whether that was Pennywise taking the form of George's fear or whether it was the spider version of Pennywise, but going down in the, sing in the city sewers under Bangor, it's just Pennywise. Now, I know it's not Derry, but like, pff, come on, he saw Pennywise. Um, other things we get in Grey Matter, we get mention of a dead dog. So that's something from the King of the Card. And there's a phrase that, um, there's a phrase I just didn't understand, where he refers to somebody walking away like his ass was on sideways and he needed to crap. No idea. There was one phrase I really liked though, where he says, I tried to swallow and something tasted greasy in my throat. Yeah, nice. So nasty, gloopy, great body horror, three and a half out of five. And then Battleground next, very short, very sharp, very fun, pretty lightweight to be honest, but I still enjoyed it a lot. 2.75 for me. Um, I didn't write down any quotes or anything. Um, just breeze through the story. So, uh, here we go. What we got next? Trucks. That should be fun. So, just done trucks. Bit of a just truck for me. Um, yeah, like two out of five. I d it just didn't click at all. But I liked the the early reference to some kids having arrived in the old Fury, which obviously made me think of Christine perhaps the first mention of Christine. Um, and I liked the fact that the clock had stopped at 8.32, because eight plus three plus two is 13, which is obviously a very spooky number. Um, but yeah, it just didn't really do much for me like, at all. It sort of made me think Maximum Overdrive did a good job, actually, of taking a fairly shrug story and turning it into something fun. Um, so yeah, bit of a shame really. But we've got Sometimes They Come Back next, which I am looking forward to rereading. So a couple more night shift stories to catch up on. Um, sometimes They Come Back first. So I really enjoyed watching the film of this for this channel. It's been a while since I read the story though. Still got a lot from it. Ultimately it felt a little light or a little bit like it was perhaps originally going to be a bigger, longer piece, and it got trimmed back to be a short story for a magazine. But I still, I still had a great time with it throughout. Great vibes throughout. A really good, spooky story, and some stuff I liked in there. I liked that the teacher, um, Jim Norman, was was going to be teaching Lord of the Flies. Obviously, a very important book for King, and one of my favourite books. But shame about the mention of Negroid lips. Mm. 70s king for you i guess got very excited when it was officer nell obviously it was donald nell rather than whatever irish name nell it was in in derry but that got me that got my heart going for a little bit and i'd forgotten that in the story our main character's wife is killed by those 
undead hoodlums, whereas in the movie that doesn't happen. And I thought that little section was particularly effective, especially when one of the orderlies turned out to be one of those one of those bullies. I thought that was a really nice touch. But I ended up on 3.25 out of 5 for this. Um, so great vibes. I think even though it was one of the longer stories, it's like 40 pages, it, it's all quite episodic. And I would gladly have had this as a full-length novella. Does full-length novella work? You know what I mean. I'd have had a novella of this rather than just a 40-page story. And then after that we get Strawberry Spring. Um, similar, great vibes throughout, but this one felt even more lightweight than, than sometimes they come back. Like, it's a kind of fun story, but it also really feels like King was really trying very hard to be quite literary with it. Like, there was a section where he repeats the phrase, dripped and ran, dripped and ran, which really, to me, made me feel like he was trying to echo Ray Bradbury in... Um, in something wicked with this way it comes where there's quite a few times where he'll write and repeat things in threes and when he does it it's just got this this effortless elegance to it in here it just felt a little bit a little bit try hardy um that being said like the scene where they find this sort of cut up body with ha ha written in blood on the window great and um a little 19 o'clock so the strawberry spring in 1968 began on the 16th of March 16th day of the third month 16 plus 3 19 of course um yeah another a fun story um I liked the ending um obviously I knew it was coming I think first time I read it it was quite a bit of a oh didn't see that coming ending until right at the very end um but I've ended up with what 2.25 out of 5 um, I think that's it bottom of my list so far, which feels harsh, but is it only like, it's only 10 pages or something, it's just a little bit too lightweight to deserve a higher mark, but I still enjoyed it, and I preferred this story to the podcast adaptation from a couple of years ago, that, that was a bit of a disappointment, but anyway, anyway, another short story to come, and it's The Ledge, which I'm very excited to reread. Okay, The Ledge, then. This story was five out of five for me. It was so gripping, I didn't make any notes during the reading. I was just wanting to see what happened, even though I've read it twice before. Uh, for me, this is just a perfect little nasty story. And actually, the epitome of the kind of story I think of when I think of Night Shift. Like, even knowing if he's going to make it around the building or not. It's so tense, it's so tightly written. It's so punchy. And obviously this was one that was in a men's magazine. So it's kind of very macho as well. You can see he was really reaching for that target audience. But like, you'll never look at pigeons in the same way again. I mean, that pigeon just kept going for his ankle. like. Leave it alone. And obviously the criminal character, the gangster, was just horrible. I mean, the lead character, I mean, he was fine, but it's just the story. This is one where the story grabbed me by the cheek, forced me to look, and, you know, I honestly felt like I was holding my breath for a lot of it, because it was just like, I know he's, I know he's not going to fall, but is he going to fall? Um, so yeah, five out of five for me. Not technically the best story here, and not the best well, not the most well written, but certainly the most impactful on me so far. So yeah, this collection's a lot of fun, and I think it's, I think it's uh, Lawnmower Man next. So it's gonna stop getting fun. But hey, there's plenty more after that. So a couple more to update on. First of all, The Lawnmower Man. Not great, that one, is it? 1.5 out of 5 for me. Just just too weird and not not in a good way. Just not, not good enough. And really fat phobic as well. It's a shame because the start is really strong. Like the bit about law mowing the lawn and the cat getting chased under the lawnmower. It's a great premise, but then it just 
just it just goes odd and is not enjoyable um so yeah 1.5 probably my least favorite of the collection but then backed up by quitters ink four out of five for me loses a little bit of momentum towards the end but honestly such a good story so cold so harsh so gripping like just just really nasty it's kind of got a backman vibe to it i just love how blunt quitters ink are where they're explaining the punishment and being like oh yeah your wife will come in for the electric shock treatment and you get to watch um yeah and the last line about you know having reference cutting off the little finger and then the last line where our main character meets someone whose wife is missing a little finger Oof, that is that is nasty and one thing i noticed actually um the address of quitters inc was 237 east 48th street or 46th street i can't read my own notes they were scribbled late last night but 237 obviously this is a few years before stanley kubrick's the shining but interesting isn't it that that number should have already cropped up in the world of stephen king um so yeah quitters ink done i honestly can't remember what is up next and my book is all the way over there and i can't be bothered to go and look so you'll find out just keep watching the video okay i've got a massive zit on my head and a couple of stories to update you on so i know what you need that gets a 3.75 out of 5 for me I, broadly i really enjoyed this story um i remembered very little about it as well from my original read so it was it was nice to go back to it and not necessarily remember all of the beats i thought the ending was a little bit mm, a shrug but it was effective overall um and a couple of things I a couple of things I noticed. So um, get another reference to Bluebeard's wife. So that continues all of the King books so far referencing that. There's a character called Sandra Ackerman, who I wonder if somebody in their family has a field with some weird stones in. Um, and there was a reference to something PS19, uh, 119, sorry. But something I found, I totally forgot to get it before I push record, but so I have a, my copy. And I found in there, second-hand copy, and I found in this story, I found this ticket to go and see something in Cyprus. It was an admissions ticket for the birthplace of Aphrodite in Cyprus. But I don't know if you can see the date. The 19th of June, these people went. The 19th of June, that's... It's not 1999, it's from maybe 2008, maybe. I can't quite see the 2000, but the 19th of June, the date that Stephen King's accident happened, of course, back in 99. I mean, talk about car. That is, that is quite something. So anyway, 3.75 for I know what you need. And then Children of the Corn after that. That's a 4.25 for me. I mean great scary gripping punchy tight we've got a character called clawson who i know we get somewhere else um all the kids are obviously 19 we get talk of revival preachers and there's just some great descriptions like um marked out page 417 in my edition so let's have a look but yeah this is the description this is spoiler alert but hey we're doing spoilers in these vlogs. This is when Bert sees Vicky. And I'd forgotten how much they hate each other in this story. Because in the movie it's not quite like that. But when Bert sees Vicky. She had been mounted on a crossbar like a hideous trophy. Her arms held at the wrists and her legs at the ankles with twists of common barbed wire. 70 cents a yard at any hardware store in Nebraska. Her eyes had been ripped out. The sockets were filled with the moon flax of corn silk. Her jaws were wrenched open in a silent scream. Her mouth filled with corn husks. That is great. And the ending of the story as well, like rereading it, I can see actually how it has spawned quite so many films because there is so much more world and story that hasn't been told in the short story there. Like, I'm surprised King didn't write more of it, to be honest. Like, you can see the seeds are all there. Um, so, yeah, great stuff. So next up, last rung on the ladder, something a bit different and one that I hold very, 
fond memories of. So I'm looking forward to going back to that. Okay, not quite sure what's happened to the rest of my vlog recordings, but between me recording them and coming to pull them into edit, they vanished. So, sorry, you're going to miss out on my little thoughts of them going along. i tell you what, I will run through the scores that I gave them. Bear with me a second. So, we had got up to... Um, Children of the Corn. So, Last Rung of the Ladder, I gave 5 out of 5 to. Man Who Loved Flowers, 4 out of 5. One for the Road, 5 out of 5. Woman in the Room, 4.5 out of 5. There you go. I mean, that's all you were looking for, wasn't it? Let's crack on with the summing up. Okay, so reread of Night Shift done. And coming up in this section, I'm going to go through a bunch of things. I'm going to go through the scores on the Stephen King bingo card. I'll give you my pros and cons. I'll pick out my favourite quotes. I'll pick out some things I spotted for the first time. And I will give you that score out of five eyeballs on a bandaged hand for Night Shift. But before that, I guess just some overall thoughts. And because it's a collection, I'm going to go through my ranking of the stories based on the scores that you've just seen me go through in the vlog. But I guess some top level thoughts. These stories are great. This collection just still works as an excellent example of why Stephen King is great at short stories. What was interesting reading it this time was that he's clearly not the finished article as a writer in these stories. These stories are not as well written as he would go on to write short stories. But the actual stories themselves, the scares, the stings in the tail, the themes, the images, the monsters, they're all so good. And it's got that raw energy. It's got a real good pace to it. There are hooks all over the place. Like, you can tell it's early in his career. And it's totally understandable, even nearly 50 years on why most people see this as his best collection. I would say in terms of like the actual tales told, yeah, probably is his best. I don't think in terms of quality of writing, it's quite his best. I think his writing in the collections, everything eventual onwards are better from a technical point of view. But in terms of getting in, getting the story and getting out, this one is really tough to beat. And it was an absolute pleasure going back to it. So many bangers in here. And a generally very consistent, very strong collection from start to finish. And you know, this is something I've long recommended people go in on as a starting point for King. This reread has not changed that at all. I would absolutely still stand by that. I think it's a great place to give you a real taste of pretty much everything King does well because even stories like The Woman in the Room and The Last Rung on the Ladder give that sort of drama more literary feel to it as well so it's not all about horror so yeah I had a lovely time going back to this so let's have a look then at the rankings there are 20 stories in here and you, you'll have heard me go through my scores on the doors as I've gone through the vlog, I won't repeat the scores here, but I will just, I've tallied them up from 20 to 1 and take you down what my ranking is. I'd love to know your ranking, so let me know in the comments as well. But I have got in 20th position, Lawnmower Man. 19th position, Night Sir. 18th, Jerusalem's Lot. 17th, Trucks. 16th, Strawberry Spring. 15th, Battleground. 14th, Sometimes They Come Back, which I'm quite surprised at, but. Yeah, it was a little bit light rereading it. 13th, Grey Matter. 12th, The Mangler. 11th, Graveyard Shift. 10th, I Know What You Need. 9th, The Man Who Loved Flowers. 8th, Quit <coughs> Quitter's Inc. 7th, Children of the Corn. 6th, Woman in the Room. 5th, I in the Doorway. 4th, The Boogeyman. 3rd, The Ledge. 2nd, The Last Rung on the Ladder. And 1st, One for the Road. That's my ranking. And looking at my actual scores, 
So nine out of the 20 collected here, I gave four out of five or higher to, which is 45% of this collection is a four out of five, which is pretty impressive, right? Actually, interestingly, I'll save that actually for my score, the average score that I give for the overall collection. We'll come back to that, put a pin in that one. So yeah, that kind of sets the benchmark for the collections going forward. 45% of this book, four out of five or higher. Um, yeah, interesting. So that's kind of got us into this final section. We've still got pros and cons, quotes, things I noticed for the first time, and of course the overall score. But let's first check in on another score and the score on the Stephen King bingo card. If you don't remember the Stephen King bingo card, I did a video about it a while ago. This is just a bit of fun I had, but basically coming up with something you can check off any Stephen King book you're reading to see whether it ticks most of his cliches or things that he comes back to time and time again. There are 19 items on that list. And Night Shift scores a 6.5 out of 19, which is lower than I thought. So the ones I spotted, Scary Bully, and sometimes they come back, of course. Small Town, there's a bunch of the small towns here. Brands, they get mentioned all over the place. I didn't spot a blue chambray shirt, although thinking about it, I'm sure there must be. So I'm tempted to just call this 7.5 because surely there was one. Um, Amazing Sex, I put half a point for because there's like, there's like a couple of mentions of sex. Maine gets a point for sure. Dead Dog gets a point and 19 gets a point. But none of the others, I didn't spot them. So maybe I missed stuff. But if I did, let me know. But uh, let's call it 7.5. Let's just assume there is a blue chambray shirt in there somewhere, right? Not as high as I was expecting, but good enough. Okay, so let's go on to pros and cons. So three things I really liked about this collection and three things I didn't like. We'll start with the cons. First con, the Lord Murmur. Just, just no. No, it just gets its own reason. Number two, I mean, I'm starting, it's, it's tricky to find cons here because it was such an enjoyable experience, but we've got 20 stories here. I feel like there was maybe a couple too many. Two or three could have been trimmed from this. And it would probably strengthen the collection overall in terms of quality throughout. So it's maybe just a little bit too packed. I get it. There's there's something to be had in all of the stories here. Even the lawnmower man has that that nice image. Well it's not nice, isn't it? It's not nice, is it? But the, the image of the cat at the start. Still good. And my final con was that actually there are a couple of stories in here that I remembered really fondly, but going back I actually felt quite light rereading them. So sometimes they come back. Strawberry Spring, Battleground. They were ones that were really quite firmly planted in my memory and they just didn't deliver as much on reread. So maybe a couple of them were a bit light, but hey, they were in magazines. So they were right. They were written to tight word counts. So I get it, but I had to find three cons. So there we go. As for my pros, my things I really enjoyed. I mean, first of all, the pacing and the tightness of the writing. Like I've just said that these stories were in magazines and therefore were written to tight word counts. And that works as a pro as well, because there's barely a word wasted in these stories. And it's so punchy. It's so engaging and engrossing right away. Just the tightness of the writing. So, so good. My second pro, the scares. The scares here are just on another level. Like, just thinking like the boogeyman. Sometimes they come back. Graveyard shit. The mangler. There's so many across this one. Even the more subtle ones like The Man Who Loved Flowers. It's just a terrifying book and it's great. My third pro is King dipping into and giving us a first real flex of his drama muscles. We got the last rung on the ladder, the woman in the room. Like these bits of writing feel personal, feel deep and meaningful. And they're not just about horror. They're still dark, they still get under your skin, but they showed even on the fifth book of his career, fourth, if we're saying that Rage was a background book at that time, so people didn't know it was King, 
really early on in his career, he's saying, I'm about more than just horror. But I will also give you a story about a giant piece of machinery that's possessed by a flesh-eating demon, because I can also do horror still. Just great. I just loved bringing that flex in at this point. What sort of things do you like and dislike about my shit? Let me know in the comments. Okay, so on to things that I noticed for the first time. So this is maybe connections to other King works, 19s, character names, all of those kind of things. There's quite a few, so strap in. Jerusalem's Lot. I saw a mention of 1900 years that man has spent doing something or other. There was a nice little detail that the whole town disappeared on Halloween, which doesn't tie into a King work in it per se, but he doesn't really do stuff on Halloween, but I liked that there is this here. There's also a story of a preacher who sleeps with a lot of the local townswomen, which remind me of a preacher doing the same thing in Haven in the Tommy Knockers. Graveyard Shift is set in Gates Fall, which was mentioned in Rage. Night Surf. The disease is A6, which is the same disease as a stand, but interestingly in Night Surf we get a mention that it's from originated from Southeast Asia, which perhaps made me feel like it was the stand but a different level of the tower like we get in Wizard and Glass. And also the weird like prediction for COVID as well, kind of creepy. The Mangler. I think we get the first recorded Stephen King instance of an Adam's apple bobbing like a monkey on a stick, which is a classic Kingism, not on the bingo card, but could well have been. Um, I like spotting that. Grey Matter is in Bangor, um, and as I mentioned in the vlog, that guy saw Pennywise, right? Definitely, when he went down to the sewers and came out with his with his white hair and just being like, nope. Um, trucks, we get someone turn up in an old Fury, like Christine, we got the boy who looked about 19. And nice little detail that the clock stopped at 8.32, because 8 plus 3 plus 2 equals 13, which is a nice spooky number. Sometimes they come back, the teacher is teaching Lord of the Flies which is a very influential book for King. We get the student wanting to slash his teacher's car's tires, like what happened to Jack in The Shining. As I mentioned in the vlog, there's Officer Nell, a different Officer Nell to it, but it was nice seeing that name. Strawberry Spring, I think I mentioned this, but it began on the 16th of March. 16 plus three is 19. Um, mentioned this for Quitters Inc, but it, their offices are 237. East 46th Street or East 48th Street, whatever it was, I can't read my writing here. But obviously 237 would be uh, something of importance in the movie of The Shining. I know what you need. There's a character called Sandra Ackerman, Ackerman's Field from N. We get the Bluebeard's wife story again. And there's another 19 there. Um, in there somewhere, a PS119. Um, Children of the Corn, all the kids are 19 when they go out and walk beyond, behind the rows. And there's a character called Clawson, and that is the same name as the character in The Dark Half who discovers Thad's secret identity and threatens to put out there to the world. Last Rung on the Ladder is our first ever visit to Hemingford Home, which is where Mother Abigail and the Stan lives and where Ben, adult Ben in It, would go and live as well. And I think that was everything I had, but if you spotted anything, do let me know. So when it comes to favourite quotes, there were loads in here. I've limited myself to three and tried to pick ones that really show the different things that I really liked about this. So starting off with the woman in the room, this is just a 10 word sentence that just did so much for me. Obviously this story is set in a hospital and just, it's a it's a, an old, an adult man and his elderly mother. It just says, his lie and her death began in the same place just incredibly powerful and real right because that is reality for millions of people there's also a lot of nasty descriptions in night shift and one that i particularly liked was in gray matter where the narrator just says i tried to swallow and something tasted greasy in my throat I mean, there's loads of gore and violence in here but that just made me feel ick more than anything else i think great stuff and then lastly some poetic of literary writing from one for the road i just love this couple of sentences it's the wind i don't like when it picks up and begins to howl driving the snow into a hundred weird flying shapes and sounding like all the hate and pain and fear in the world there's death in the throat of the snowstorm wind white death and maybe something beyond death 
I mean, yeah, that is good, right? Okay, on to overall score then. Now, I mentioned I was putting a pin in something earlier, and that was that I worked out my average based on all the scores I get for the 20, stor 20 stories here to give an average score out of 5. So my average worked out at 3.54 out of 5, which is fine, it's fair, that's what the maths bring out, but it also felt, didn't quite sit right with me. Now it's my channel, I can do what I want, so I'm throwing in a little bit extra for the fun experience of rereading this book and just the vibe of this book. So I'm rounding it up to four, okay? So my score is four eyeballs on an itchy palm covered in bandages out of five. Now that's the same score I gave it as carry, but I would put it above carry. So my overall ongoing ranking so far in fifth place is Rage, in fourth place is Carry, in third is a new entry, is Light Shift, and in second is The Shining, and first currently is Salem's Lot. So there we go. Let me know what your score out of five would be for Night Shift. And that concludes our reread of Night Shift. Thank you for sticking this far. If you've made it this far, hey, click around, look at the links, subscribe to the channel, all of that kind of stuff. Check out my own collection if you want to. And do come back soon for the next stop on the chronological reread, which most of you will know is The Stand. Now, if you're a regular around here, you'll know The Stand is not my favorite Stephen King book. So I thought, how can I, how can I give myself a proper enriching experience when I come to reread it? And here's what I came up with. I'm gonna read the original cut version and the uncut version at the same time. Yep, I'm reading The Stand twice at once, just for this channel. That's the kind of suffering I put myself through, bring you this content. So it might be a while until we get to the stand because what, that's about 2000 pages total across those two books, but I'm interested to compare and contrast. And frankly, I don't want to have to reread the stand again when I get to 1990 on my chronological reread. So I may as well get it done and out of the way at this point and then can move on to the next one. So take care. Thank you for watching. Do go and reread The Night Shift if you haven't read it yourself for a while. And come back here soon for our next step on the chronological reread. Bye bye.